can get uh, recording going. And um, so good afternoon, everybody from Ethiopia. Um, we have our second presentation on this series of uh, colorectal and anal diseases. And the presenter today is uh, Dr. Neha, Dr. Antone Gerdisa from uh, Hawassa University. He's an assistant professor of surgery. Uh, he's a general and colorectal surgeon. Uh, he's a graduate from Jimma University. Subsequently did his general surgery training at Addis Ababa University, followed by uh, from uh, uh, 2018 to 2019 uh, in a certificate program in colorectal surgery in Bangalore, India. Uh, Dr. Antone is currently a chief executive director, um, delegated with the rank of vice president at the College of uh, Medicine and Health Sciences at Hawassa University. He is really a dynamic uh, uh, person in terms of both teaching um, and also collaborating to really improve care at the Department of Surgery in Hawassa. It's a, a real pleasure to have him as a presenter today. And Dr. Antone, uh, the, um, the floor is yours. And uh, thank you for uh, participating in the series. Okay, thank you, Prof, for the generous introduction. So, uh, as you all can see uh, today, we're gonna <coughs> see uh, uh, management of colorectal trauma, bulbless, and a little bit of uh, diverticular diseases, given that it is not that common in our setup and our experience is limited. So, we'll, we'll, we'll deal uh, with diverticular disease at the end with, with uh, you know, a little uh, bit focus. We'll focus our discussion on the first two two uh, conditions. So, can you hear me, Pro? Yes, we can hear you. No. Yes, okay. Can. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. So, uh, sorry. Okay. So, uh, as you can see, we will we will see these uh, three topics one by one. So the first one will be on the trauma of colon rectum and anus. So <clears throat> as, you, as, as you can see, uh, as is in the introduction part of management of colorectal uh, uh, injuries has really evolved considerably over the past uh, a century and a half with the mortality decreasing from more than 90% during the American Civil War to less than 10% uh, actually to less than 2 to 3% during the last uh, uh, American uh, Iraqi war. So as you can see, so the history of uh, uh, management and, and uh, the subsequent uh, evolution of the um, management of colon and rectal trauma I usually uh, correlates with the uh, history of war. So those wartime experiences are actually uh, 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 are used in the civilian setting. So the management has evolved during uh, with the evolution of, of, of uh, those things. So there are multiple factors for, for improvement in the mortality from more than 90% uh, to oh, less than 10% actually. So this include uh, the uh, uh, decrease in transport time, uh, evolution, the invention of antibiotics during this era, Technical technical uh, improvement in surgery and the principles of, of uh, uh, resuscitation and blood transfusion and so on. So evolution in those factors has, has actually uh, contributed to the decreased mortality and, and uh, management of colorectal uh, traumas. Uh, it's not just simply because of improvement in surgery. So, so uh, despite the presence of quality evidence in management controversy still exists because surgeons go back and forth between dogmatic principles in the management of polar uh, and rectal traumas and and actually the existing data. So that's one of the, the reasons that controversy still exists. So, and uh, uh, usually one of the, the, the bias or the dogmatic principles that, that influences the, the management of colorectal uh, injury is uh, the uh, this this quote from uh, uh, Dr. William Ogilvy is uh, <clears throat> uh, 
an English surgeon who served in both World Wars, actually, World War One and World War Two. So after finishing the, the, his service in World War Two, when he published his findings, so what he said was, whenever there is any kind of, of, of color, colonic injury, it should be diverted. So in uh, stating that however simple a colonic wound is, if, if you suture it, so there is a high chance that it may leak. So he, he advocated the dogmatic thinking that all colonic uh, injuries should be diverted. And this, this thinking has greatly influenced the management of, of colon and rectal traumas to date. So when we see the epidemiology of colorectal uh, injuries, usually the commonest cause is penetrating injury when, it come, when we see the global data with gunshot wounds being the, 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 much, the major culprit in, in, in uh, uh, injury, so followed by star wounds and, and uh, impalement wounds uh, uh, subsequently. So more than 90% of all the colorectal, colorectal injuries are actually due to penetrating injury. So this is, colon is the second commonly affected organ in, in penetrating injury, followed by, by small bowel. So it, it actually depends on how much surface area actually it, con it occupies within the abdominal cavity to, so to be affected by, by this one. So the second cause is uh, blunt trauma. Blunt trauma mostly due to uh, uh, road traffic accidents, which is actually the, 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 the scenario, the common scenario in, in our, our setup, so second commerce as well. And uh, uh, usually in blunt traumas, uh, uh, this vascular injuries, hematomas are, are really common. So blast injuries uh, due to expo explosion and so on, these are also the other commonest causes resulting in blowout injuries and so on. Currently, there are also atherogenic injuries following surgery, following uh, colonoscopies and, and so on. And there are also some reports following uh, barium studies as well. When you see uh, an Ethiopian data, usually, I thought this may be representative of all. This is a recent publication from uh, St. Paul Hospital. So they reviewed a three years review of, of all abdominal injuries uh, managed in, in St. Paul Hospital. So penetrating injuries is still the commonest one, but despite, uh, in contrary to the global data, STAB is the commonest. When you see the global data, gunshot wounds are the commonest one. So blunt is also the second commonest cause, but um, road traffic accident being the, the, the main, main uh, cause of blunt uh, 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 abdominal injury. So associated injuries are usually diagnosed in around one third of cases with uh, uh, Point, uh, well, 8.5 mortality, overall mortality. This is not specific for uh, colonic injury, so I couldn't find any data related to colonic injury. This is uh, with overall abdominal uh, injury. So based on the extent of injury and the mechanism of injury, so the American Association of uh, Trauma Surgeries, they, they classified uh, colonic injury into these five, five sections. So we will see the, the importance of this classification when we see later on the, the management part. So when we see the uh, diagnosis, so uh, usually uh, prompt abdominal exploration accurately, accurately finds out the, the uh, colonic injury. So uh, when we when we find, when we see patients with, with an, any kind of abdominal trauma, be it uh, penetrating or, or uh, uh, blunt abdominal injury, the first the first thing is to assess the patient for hemodynamic stability and uh, signs of peritonitis. So the, the first thing is it's usually not necessary to actually diagnose the exact organ injury once a patient has any indication for surgery. Then the accurate diagnosis is usually made. After, uh, during surgery, during laparotomy. So diagnostic investigations are necessary usually when the patient does not have any indication, any uh, uh, upfront indication for, for surgery, like stable patients with, with some, uh, or patients with concomitant uh, 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 head injury or spinal cord injury, in which it is difficult to diagnose. So for such kind of patients, usually it's triple contrast CT. That is, is, is said to be the gold standard with, with diagnostic accuracy more than 90%. So the, if you find any, any uh, uh, free fluid in the abdomen in, or 
and uh, free gas in the abdomen in the absence of, of uh, solid organ injuries that is usually an indication for, for some sort of uh, hollow viscous injuries or some sort of vascular injuries. So that's, uh, that's a really important uh, uh, investigative modality in the, in the diagnosis of uh, uh, blunt abdominal or uh, for that matter, uh, uh, penetrating abdominal injuries with flank wounds and with stable patients with no signs of peritonitis. So diagnostic peritoneal lavage is stated in most textbooks, but in the contemporary practice, usually it's not, it's not uh, being practiced because of uh, the, 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 usually the diagnostic accuracy is uh, similar to those non-invasive uh, modalities like uh, uh, fast scanning or other scanning, so ultrasound scanning, usually it's not necessary, but if, if, if deemed necessary, the, the, uh, 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 it's also uh, important with, with uh, uh, similar or uh, comparable diagnostic accuracy with the fast and other uh, scanning. So diagnostic uh, laparoscopy is currently being, coming into picture, especially in, in stable patients. Uh, especially in rectal uh, injury patient with no signs of peritonitis, usually it's 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 coming uh, into picture as uh, one of the diagnostic uh, modalities, but it's not also being practiced uh, widely. So when you come to the treatment of of, of uh, colonic injury, as I have mentioned in the introduction part. <clears throat> It is the history is usually the history of of, of war. So the, the the mortality has been has been decreasing uh, exponentially during from the American Civil War to the uh, Iraqi American War to less than uh, two to three percent. So as I have mentioned earlier, it's it, there are multiple factors which are related with the decreased mortality, including antibiotics, resuscitation, blood transfusion, and and uh, uh, an improvement in surgical techniques uh, as well. So the current operative trend usually. So I want to see the the the, the management in 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 terms of the type of colonic wound, the location of the colonic wound, the mechanism of injury, and uh, the need for damage control surgery. So how do we manage colonic injuries in the setting of, of, of damage uh, control uh, surgery? So when we see, so uh, in patients with with uh, penetrating colon wounds, if it is a destructive colon wound, that means if it is more than grade three, four or five, these are uh, wounds with more than 50% of colon wall circumference, complete transaction or devascularized segment. The, the previous dogmatic principle was, as we've mentioned earlier, so all colonic wounds has to be diverted. So, but the current, usually the, the, this, this um, game changer studies uh, start to uh, occur uh, after the 1970s, okay? So after that, what they did was, if whenever there is a full thickness colonic wound, they classified the wounds as whether they have non-destructive colonic wounds or destructive colonic wounds. Non-destructive colonic wounds means as to the classification, either it is grade one B, grade one A is just hematoma with no with no tissue, so that we can not include it here. So grade one B or grade two, if it is non-destructive, usually whatever kind of patient condition, what comorbid or they routinely did uh, primary repair with 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 better results. Okay. But when we when it is a destructive wound, we can we can we can see patients in two groups. Patients with no comorbidities with stable hemodynamics and with uh, need of transfusion less than six units of factory plus cell, then in such kind of patients, we can do resection and anastomosis safely and with comparable leak rate with, uh, with uh, the other group of patients. But if patients have comorbidities or if they need more than six units of factory plus cell, then those are candidates for, for uh, diversion. So these are these are these are the graphs that you, you can see the mortality, the colon related mortality, leak rate, and abscess formation all decreased when 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 surgeons 
started follow following this this uh, principle of, of uh, grouping patients into high risk and low risk patients. So low risk being less comorbidity, less need of transfusion, with high risk patients, with so those are patients with comorbidity and need for uh, uh, multiple transfusion who need uh, uh, aversion. So. <clears throat> That, that is the colon wound location. That means whether the wound happened at the ascending colon, transverse colon, or uh, sending or sigmoid. So again, the thinking was just when it is right side, just do hemicolectomy. When it is left side, do or, or diversion. That was the, 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 the other dogma following the Ogilvy's principle. So, but uh, with multiple studies, if you follow the, the earlier principle of, of, uh, of classifying patients into high risk and low risk patients, the suture line failure cause, that means leak rate, colon related morbidity, and colon related uh, uh, mortality, or the, the, they have similar, similar outcome, or statistically, there is no significant difference whether you do diversion or, 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 or uh, primary resection and anastomosis. So to choose whether to do primary resection and anastomosis or primary repair and diversion doesn't actually depend on the location, rather it depends on the patient group, whether they are in the high risk or in the low risk. High risk being the, the ones with comorbidities and need for transfusion and hemodynamic instability, the low risk groups being the ones with no comorbidity, with stable hemodynamic status and with, uh, with less need of, of uh, transfusion. So if they are in the same group, whether it is in the ascending, transfer, descending, or sigmoid, just follow the other principles. So right, uh, with the right uh, side or uh, left side uh, wounds. The other is blunt colon wounds. So as I've mentioned in the epidemiology part, so blunt colonic injuries usually they are prone to ischemia, okay? They are usually in blunt, uh, deceleration injuries, so the mobile parts of, 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 of the colon usually they are liable to uh, tear and shear forces, so there is high risk of, of uh, uh, vascular injury and ischemia, mesenteric ischemia. Therefore, traditional uh, uh, schemes may not apply for blunt injuries, but the patient, if you follow the same principle, the, the, the usually patients fall in the, in the high risk for uh, anastomotic leak. So the definition a little bit changed. So if uh, from the, the the destructive wounds in colon, blunt colon injuries is, is a little bit different from the penetrating injury. So in any sort of blunt abdominal injury, if there is full thickness perforation in the colon, we should consider that as, as, as a, a mm, destructive wound not only 50% uh, circumference of the colon. So less than, more than 50% serosal tear and full thickness perforation are considered as destructive. So when you see the perforate, I mean penetrating injury, it is more than 50% of the colonic circumference tear, not serosal tear. But here, if there is serosal tear more than 50%, so uh, of, of, of uh, so colonic circumference, or if there is any, any amount of full uh, thickness perforation, or if there is any mesenteric vascular injury, such, mm -hmm. such, wound, such colonic wounds are considered as, as destructive wounds. So usually what is different from uh, uh, the penetrating ones is in the definition of the, 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 the destructive uh, wound. So, once we define destructive wounds in, in blunt uh, colonic injury, then the, the, the selection of doing whether to do primary uh, anastomosis or to the diversion, again, uh, is similar results uh, in, in, in the previous uh, groups. <clears throat> so the other thing that comes into picture currently is the, the, the need for uh, damage control surgery, okay? So the, the so whenever if any patient with abdominal trauma comes with hypothermia, acidosis, or coagulopathy, then these are a group of patients that needs 
damage control surgery. So in this damage control surgery, what the primary aim is to control breeding and 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 uh, to control uh, gross contamination. So in such cases, if the surgery is abbreviated, then patients are sent back to ICU for for resuscitation, and they will be taken back for second look after 24 72 hours. So this is for just academic discussion because we're not doing such uh, abbreviated laparotomies for our setting because of lack of like different uh, facilities, ICU facility, and even we don't have a uh, setup for determining the acid, uh, the blood gas analysis, so we don't know, we don't, we don't have the, the, the setup to select those patients, so we usually do directly take them for, for definitive surgery, but if we have the setup, to do uh, those those facilities to select patients for damage control uh, surgery, then the the, the, the principle in, in these patients is so after 72 hours, if if the proximal uh, I mean if the bowel has persistent edema, then usually it's better to do diversions and uh, 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 anastomosis. But if the edema has subs- if the patient has stabilized and was, is taken back to, to uh, surgery uh, OR, so patients with uh, in the left uh, uh, colon, if if uh, uh, they have high risk for leaks, that means those with comorbidity and multiple transfusion and so on, then it is it's better to do stoma. But if it is low risk, then it's even possible after. Uh, damage control surgery to do a resection and anastomosis with, with no increased chance of leak. But if it is in the right side, then we can also do resection with right hemicolectomy and, and uh, leocolic uh, anastomosis. Again. So, but in patients with, with, with who doesn't need uh, damage control surgery, we have, we have discussed earlier those principles. <coughs> So once we categorize those patients and once we know how, which patients need uh, exploration for, uh, I mean, which need primary or which needs diversion, then there are general uh, technical considerations which we uh, uh, consider for all, all our patients. So one, uh, one, one technical consideration is it's always advisable to fully mobilize the colon during surgery. If you find anti perforation, then it's better to look for, for the, the, the counter perforation usually because if it is, uh, especially if it is, if it is uh, penetrating injury, usually tends to have two, two perforations, okay? And in blunt injury, I mean, in penetrating injuries, palacolic hematoma should always be explored. And nearby perforation within few centimeters apart, then you can, you, you can divide the intervening, the bridging normal tissue, then you can repair it as one, one perforation rather than doing two perforations nearby, as you can see in the picture. So single layer versus double layer, suture versus staples. Usually it's, it all depends on how, which techniques you're accustomed to rather than uh, on, the, on the type of, of uh, suturing or the type of uh, whether suture or staples, it's, on how you do well on those things that really matters about the, the, the leak. Okay, so whichever uh, method you're practicing, if you're good at it, so the, usually the leak rate uh, remains uh, similar in, in all, all kinds of uh, suture techniques. So, uh, iliocolostomy, like versus colocolostomy, especially in patients with with uh, transverse colon injury, uh, uh, there are there are things there are uh, surgeons who prefer even to do right, extended right hemicolectomy even for for uh, uh, destructive wounds in the transverse colon, and there are also some who, who recommend doing colocolostomy. So that that most most agree if the wound is 
proximal to the uh, uh, middle colic arteries, and you can do right endocolectomy, and you, you can do iliotransverse anastomosis. But if it is distal to the mid uh, colic artery, then you can just do segmental resection of the transverse colon, and you can do colo colic anastomosis safely. And the other thing, the other technical thing that you should consider is it's always better to leave colon, the, the wound, the skin open in, in after, after surgery for, for our colonic uh, traumas. Okay? The other thing is rectal and anal trauma. Okay, the majority of rectal injuries again are penetrating with more than eighty percent from gunshot wounds in most in most cases. Accidental or intentional impalement injuries, atherogenic injuries, and rectal foreign foreign bodies constitute the rest twenty percent. Okay, and uh, rectum can also be perforated following blunt trauma, especially if there is associated pelvic uh, uh, injury, okay, pelvic bone fractures, falling out is another, another uh, cause for uh, rectal injuries, okay. So diagnosis is usually uh, based on physical examination. Gross blood on digital rectal examination is the initial indication for high, for uh, rectal injuries, which is highly suggestive. And if you find, uh, blood on rectal examination, then the next step is usually to do diagnostic sigmoidoscopy being rigid or flexible sigmoidoscopy. The diagnostic accuracy actually is up to 95% in, in, in for uh, rectal injury. So uh, certain injury patterns like stab injuries or, or uh, gunshot wounds may, may mandate for uh, or investigation with uh, with CT scan, even in the absence of uh, of uh, blood on rectal digital rectal examination. But when it comes to rectal injury, most are obvious because they are external. So simple physical examination is is enough uh, to diagnose uh, anal injuries. When it comes to the surgical treatment, so intraperitoneal rectal injuries are managed with uh, similar principles as uh, uh, colonic injuries. But all the classic 3Ds in rectal injuries, diversion, drainage, uh, 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 and this are, are uh, uh, usually uh, challenged in, 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 in modern uh, civilian uh, injuries. So small perforations, can simply be closed without any kind of stoma, so especially that in intraperitoneal. But inaccessible perforations, that means retroperitoneal rectal injuries, usually they can be managed with simple stoma. And if uh, rectal injuries are destructive following uh, rec um, road traffic accidents or uh, destructive uh, injuries due to due to bullet injuries. Uh, then the, we can we can do resection with diversion, or if they are severe enough, then sometimes they can be managed with uh, abdominal perineal resection as well after stabilizing such uh, patients. So, uh, laparoscopy in in uh, rectal injury, as you can see, if if you perform any any uh, sigmoidoscopy and you note a level of injury, and if there is no Bladder injuries with lesion with CT scan, especially in uh, bullet injuries or with, with uh, stab injuries with trajectories towards uh, the bladder. And if the patient does not have any acute abdomen mandating uh, direct lap uh, laparotomy, then this can be uh, laparoscopy can have some place. So with lap diagnostic laparoscopy, if you find intraperitoneal blood or breaching the peritoneum, then these are indications for laparotomy. But in those, in the absence of blood or breach, then those patients can be managed with simple repair or with sigmoid loop colostomy rather than being full, full uh, laparotomy. So in summary, so primary repair is the treatment of choice for all non-destructive colonic injuries. Okay, resection and anastomosis again is a safer choice for most destructive injuries. If you wisely select your patients based on the 
the criteria that we've been uh, discussing briefly. Okay? If they have, don't have significant pre-injury comorbidities or if they don't have any significant hemodynamic derangement, then, then, uh, then uh, resection again is the safest choice. But diversion should be considered if patients uh, uh, have, have undergone damage control laparotomy or if they have significant uh, comorbidity and hemodynamic instability. Uh, Okay. So primary repair is appropriate choice for accessible rectal injuries and diversion alone without, without any direct repair exception to treat extraperitoneal rectal injuries if, if they are not necessary. So pre-sacral drainage, distal washout are no longer recommended as we have mentioned earlier. So anal injuries usually that are amenable for delayed reconstruction. Okay. So this is all about uh, injuries. Okay. So when you come to the second topic, which is a uh, colonic volvulus, so this is one of the common, the common uh, 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 surgical conditions that we usually, we usually encounter in our setting. So volvulus simply means it is a twist of the colon, the, the colon along its mesentery. So the commonest. Uh, 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 Type of volvulus that we encounter here is a sigmoid, and followed by second. But there are also combined or, or, or volvuluses usually for sigmoid with ileum, sigmoid with sigma, or, or, and, and so on. So the commonest, as we mentioned, is the sigmoid. So it's very, it's not, it's not very common in the westerns. Usually, it's said that it, it accounts for less than ten percent of all large bowel uh, obstructions in the western, but in, in, in less developed part of the world, it, it usually accounts more than 50% of the intestinal obstruction. The, the, the figure is the same in, in, in our setup as well. So usually this is related with, with the, the, the dietary habits. So in the Western, it's, uh, they usually use refined with uh, food with uh, less fiber content. So they, they have uh, the, the stool bulk is very small and such kinds of uh, people are usually prone to develop uh, diverticular disease rather than uh, volvulus, but in less, develop, in, uh, in less developed part of the world where the, the, the diet is uh, rich in, in, in fiber and it's bulky, so the, the colon is usually, uh, they, they will have uh, acquired megacolon, which, which is it's an anatomic prerequisite for, for uh, 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 this volvula. So usually males are uh, affected more and the in, in, in uh, developed countries, as I've mentioned earlier, it's less common and if at all it occurs, it occurs in, in a very old uh, population. Okay, those institutionalized, those with mental uh, problems, taking some drugs and so on. But in developing countries, usually it occurs in younger age groups, okay? The average age being in, in mid fifties. And it can be, it can, it can be seen uh, even in people with, in their twenties and thirties. So uh, as I've mentioned in the etiology and pathogenesis, so the anatomic prerequisites are long within the sigmoid, narrowed basentry, this acquired megacolon, and so on. So the PK, as I've mentioned earlier, in the Western is in 70s and 80s, but when it comes to the less developed part of the world, in the 50s, uh, and they can be seen even as early as 20s and 30s. So common presentation style, abdominal pain, distension, and uh, failure to pass faces and platters. Vomiting is usually a, a, a not a common uh, present, presenting symptom. If at all it occurs, it, it occurs very, very late. So it occurs in, in some segment of population where they have the uh, incompetent eosical valve. When the distension persists, then it results in ileal distension as well, resulting in vomiting. Otherwise, most patients may not have, uh, have uh, 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 vomiting. So usually physical examination, you will find very distended abdomen with, with hypertympanic and drum-like abdomen. In, in comparison with uh, uh, <clears throat> fecal impaction or other, other malignant obstruction, in patients with sigmoid volvulus, the typical finding is on digital rectal examination, you'll find 
empty the rectal uh, ampulla. So usually they will, if they come early, they will have, they will not have any signs of peritonitis. But if you find signs of peritonitis, then it is a sign of 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 a uh, gum penis change. Okay. When it comes to uh, the diagnosis, usually that uh, radiology suffices. So commonly we use plain abdominal X-ray. So in 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 plain abdominal X-ray. So the, 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 the typical finding is a hugely distended uh, large bowel wall, usually which is called uh, uh, omega sign, or you can see the co-opting uh, colon walls, which appear as in a, a bent inner tube sign. Uh, these are classic, classic uh, findings in patients with uh, sigmoid uh, pulvula. So, around 65 to 70 percent of patients may have this such a typical uh, radiologic findings okay but if you use contrast enema then on contrast enema you can see the classic bird speak appearance on the left side of the hemi abdomen and this is 100 percent diagnostic in patients with sigma corpus but in ct scan if if at all then then you can see distended bowel wall usually with whirlpool sign with the twisted mesentery are classical diagnostic signs in, 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 in uh, sigma volvulus okay so <clears throat> when it comes to the management usually the main stain of management is early distortion okay early distortion especially if patient presents with with uh, no sign of distortion is the, the mainstay of emergency treatment. Whether it is using blind rectal tube deflation or using rigid proctoscope or, or flexible sigmoidoscope or sometimes colonoscope, these are the main the mainstay of management. Unless the patient has signs of peritonates which mandates necessary laparotomies. Okay, but with these methods, successful decompression is uh, uh, achieved in up to eight deflated usually recurrence is very common okay recurrence is is, is uh, very common so once deflated that's not the end of the story it's usually we need a definitive treatment okay definitive treatment so the definitive treatment following following the uh, deflation usually can be done during the same admission okay can be done during the same admission we can wait a few days to rest the bowel to decrease the, uh, the edema then you can prepare the bowel and, and, and uh, uh, you can do the resection during uh, the same admission okay but uh, there are also some some non-resective options which are mentioned in textbook which uh, i've never done one but uh, if, if uh, uh, others have done it we can we can share the experience later on but there are other options like sigmoidopexy mesosigmoidoplasty as this one is mesosigmoidoplasty then to widen the uh, sigmoid mesentery so to decrease chance of of, of uh, uh, re, uh, recurrence or we can do sigmoidopexy Okay, this one is stepped sigmoid opaxy or mesh sigmoid opaxy. These are different options of non-resective options that are mentioned in, in textbooks. Uh, the other group of patients are if decompression is not possible or if patient comes with signs symptoms of peritonitis, then these are the kinds of patients who need emergency surgical options. So in such kind of patients, the patient first has to be rehydrated, electrolyte abnormalities, anemias, if if uh, if uh, they have one has to be corrected and antibiotics has to be given the patient has to be taken um, for emergency surgery okay then during emergency we can we have uh, two options either we can do resection with primary anastomosis or we can do hartman's colostomy depending on the condition of the patient okay hemodynamically stable no comorbidity uh, and uh, uh, no any intraoperative hypotension and if the operating surgeon is uh, is is comfortable then you can proceed and do a resection and anastomosis with with safe and and uh, good results but if patient has any comorbidities or if they have 
any any uh, hemodynamic instability, then it's always safer to do uh, a colostomy, heart mass colostomy, and later on after stabilization, you can you can actually take it down. But in in, in literature, usually this Hartman colostomy in the westerns, given that the patient their patient is the patients are very old and usually they have concomitant concomitant comorbidities usually it's uh, it's permanent colostomy but for our uh, group of patients who are young and fit patients and with uh, with no comorbidities usually almost all all stomas are uh, reversible in, in our uh, in our settings the second commonest commonest volvulus uh, in, 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 uh, in the colon is the sacral volvulus, which actually constitutes about 46% of colonic volvulus, okay? So it remains, however, uncommon cause of intestinal obstruction, even if when, when you see it, it is a colon, colon it's, it's, it's common. So it's, it's, it's usually common in younger and in females when, when you compare with, with, uh, with a sigmoid volvulus, okay? There are other, other risk factors like previous surgery, uh, uh, surgical manipulation, adhesion, or congenital bands, pregnancy, pelvic masses, and extreme exertions are said to be some predisposing factors, okay? <clears throat> so usually there are of two types when you see this uh, sacral volvulus, these are, this is, these are the true sacral volvulus where the second the uh, distal ileum and ascending colon form a, a sort of volvulus around uh, distal iliosacral uh, mesentery. Okay, so this is the classic, the classic uh, 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 sacral volvulus. So for this to happen, the second and ascending colon has to be uh, mobile. Okay, so be it. Uh, Usually congenital, it has to be mobile. So this is the classic and the commonest one uh, form of uh, sacral volvulus. The other one is when 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 this it's only the sacrum that's mobile. Usually, what happens is the sacrum falls over the anterior ascending colon, rather than forming the, the actual twist. So this this kind of of uh, sacral uh, volvulus is called sacral bascule. Okay sacral basket where the second folds anteriorly over the ascending colon rather than forming the actual twist. So in uh, patients with, with the sacral volvulus usually they, they present with small signs symptoms of small bowel obstruction, okay? So they have crampy abdominal pain, vomiting and uh, distension and so on rather than in, in, in the form of uh, large bowel obstruction, okay? So uh, usually they will have a closed loop sacral obstruction and proximal small bowel uh, obstruction, okay? If it is a classic form of sacral volvulus, the presentation is usually fulminant and acute, but in case of uh, sacral bascule, it can be intermittent and recurrent presentation, okay? intermittent and recurrent presentation. Diagnosis is usually based on radiology, so the patient may have this uh, 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 distended uh, sacrum, which appears as uh, a coffee bean facing the left upper quadrant, okay? Coffee bean facing the upper quadrant if it is in plain abdominal field. Or you can see the bird speak appearance in the right uh, quadrant abdomen rather than the left quadrant in, in case of uh, sigmoid volvulus, okay? <clears throat> so when you see the treatment, treatment, the aparatomy remains a treatment modality for sacral volvulus in comparison with uh, Sigmoid, where, where we can uh, do uh, distortion with uh, endoscopy or blind distortion. So distortion is not uh, usually not an option in patients with sickle volvula. So uh, surgery is a mainstay of treatment in, 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 in uh, uh, sickle volvula. So surgical options usually resection remains the uh, gold standard treatment choice. Okay. So when once we did, especially if, if it is uh, if the the the, the the torso segment is gangrenous, and that's the only option actually. So resection, that means right hand colectomy with iliotransfer anastomosis remains a, a standard treatment of choice in patients with second volvulus. But if it is viable uh, 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 volvulus, then there are options of just detorsion or uh, uh, detorsion and fixing like uh, the one you see in this picture you can do 
Cecopexy uh, uh, like this one. So Cecopexy, you can do it with or without without Cecostomy. Uh, so if the if you uh, you determine to do Cecopexy, uh, the and if if the ascending colon and the cecum are grossly distended, then it is it's advisable to leave Cecostomy uh, tube uh, in place. Okay. So it's it's usually used as a vent rather than the fixative the fixation, but this one is more more important for venting in case of uh, gross uh, distension. Okay, so some 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 uh, surgeons describe doing appendectomy along with uh, cecopexy, as you can see in this in the other picture. But uh, that's usually I don't know why why it's uh, usually necessary, but uh, that's other option. So. The other one, maybe the third uh, type of colonic volvulus is transverse colon volvulus. It's actually it's, uh, extremely rare, and it's less than 4% of all colonic volvuluses are uh, transverse colon uh, volvuluses. Usually these ones happen in young and females with lax abdominal uh, wall. So again, like, all uh, uh, colonic volvuluses, the main predisposing factor is long uh, mesentery with redundant mesentery with, with uh, uh, closer attachment, narrow narrow base uh, mesentery. Okay? So if the in, in some females when the abdominal load is lax and when it allows the transverse colon unusually large to redundant sigmoid colon, I mean transverse colon to wander around these are the, the predisposing factor uh, for, for uh, transfer colon border. So constipation with laxative abuse, previous surgeries resulting in secondary borderless, high fiber diet, and uh, uh, these are some, some, some uh, risk factors for, for uh, sick, uh, transfer colon borderless as well. So redundant with elongated mesentery being the prerequisite anatomic uh, uh, prerequisite for bulb plus as well. So uh, presentation is a result of large bowel presentation with gross distension, lower abdominal pain, and, and absence of vomiting unless unless it is delayed presentation with 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 uh, incompetent illogical bulb resulting in that can be uh, dilated small bowel uh, loops. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, so pain as in patients with large bowel is mild to moderate, vomiting is usually absent, as I've mentioned. Okay. So diagnosis usually, uh, uh, based on the clinical presentation, it, you can suspect the diagnosis. Plain films are rarely diagnostic. So if surgery is done so that the, the, the diagnosis is usually made, during other time of exploration, rather than during uh, during surgeries. But if if uh, barium contrasts are used in stable patients, usually the blood speak deformity is picked at the mid. Okay, so when it is a sigmoid volvulus, usually you pick it in the left quadrant. When it is sickal, you can pick it in the right quadrant. But if when it is uh, it is uh, uh, in, 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 uh, transverse uh, colon volvulus that, that deformity is picked in the mid abdomen around the distal the distal transverse uh, column. But in most cases the diagnosis is usually interoperative diagnosis and diagnosis usually is expected based on clinical presentation rather than uh, imaging. So treatment usually you can uh, endoscopic distortion is possible with sigmoid, sigmoidoscopy or I mean with colonoscopy is possible, but uh, I, uh, if there is no routine service of uh, colonoscopy in some settings, then surgery is, will be the mainstay. So the mainstay of surgery again here is resection with with colocolic anastomosis, or if it is if it is associated with uh, mobile pan colon, then there are also some surgeons which who, who recommend doing extended uh, colectomy with ileo or sigmoid or even ileorectal anastomosis. Okay, ileorectal anastomosis. But in unstable patients, in elderly patients, there are also options of doing non-resectional uh, I mean, uh, procedures like uh, colopexy or or, or uh, 
coloplasty as well. So this one is parallel coloplasty where you can fix actually the 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 both segments of the transverse colon with ascending and descending colon. So that such kind of uh, procedures are done if the ascending and descending colons are fixed as it should be. But if when there are some patients where the the whole colon is mobile, in such cases it's uh, better uh, to do uh, a resection rather than doing this fixation uh, procedure. The other fixations are you actually you can fix the transverse colon along with the omentum to the anterior abdominal wall as well. So uh, the other one, the last bit of the the, the uh, uh, volvula that we can see, you will see is the iliosigmoid bit. So iliosigmoid uh, volvulus, which is also called the compound volvulus. It is one of uh, uncommon forms of volvulus in the West, but it's comparatively common in in, in uh, developing world because of the the redundancy of their their uh, uh, intestinal tract because of the high fiber diet, the bulky diet, and so on. Uh, uh, so it's usually common in young males, and it, it, there are there are uh, regions of the world that that report large series of uh, this, this condition, usually uh, uh, regions around Turkey, Russia, some Scandinavian countries uh, that they report very large numbers. But if, when you come to Ethiopia and setting, there are few case reports. There are not even case series that I could find in, in, uh, regarding this uh, illusive point. I think we have some unpublished uh, Data that we have in our in our institution, but like the, uh, we don't have actually the the, the, the real uh, data here. So what what what's uh, common uh, in in those countries that that they report is that illicit more noting is very common in certain seasons of, of of the year, especially during the Ramzan fasting months in the Muslim fasting months when, when people usually eat like one bulky diet once in a, once or twice a day, then the, there will be like vigorous uh, peristalsis that will be elicited in some particular uh, period of the day. Even what they report is this, this, this disease, they, they usually happen early in the morning when the people eat bulky diet, uh, early in the evening, usually the, what, what happens is the volvulus usually happens early in the morning. So that's a common thing that they report from all these regions. So that's, <clears throat> that's what uh, is common about this one. So when, when it comes to the pathogenesis, as I've said, usually it's, it's related with redundant sigmoid along with uh, 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 abnormally elongated mobile small intestinal mesentery. So as to the, according to which segment is active, whether it is the sigmoid or the ileum, whether it has rotated clockwise or anticlockwise, usually there are, these are four types of, of, of uh, uh, this uh, iliosigmoid noting. So this one, type one, when the, inter, the, the ileum is the active segment and it rotates clockwise and it's type one, when it is anticlockwise, you can call it type two. When the active part is a sigmoid, by the same manner, whether it's anticlockwise, clockwise, you can say type three, type four. So these are the four different types of sigmoid based on the, the pathogenesis or based on the which, uh, whether it's the or the sigmoid, okay? The onset is usually acute and fulminant and more than 70% of the cases come with gangrenous stem. So patients, when, once they come, they will come with hypothermia, oliguria, hypotension, like cardia, and acidosis. So mostly the presentations are very, very uh, fulminant. And the other thing is preoperative diagnosis is extremely difficult, okay? Because the presentations, as I mentioned, it's uh, once one, it is fulminant, the other, it, the, the patient with, will, will, will present with signs and symptoms of small bowel obstruction, but the radiologic finding is usually that of large bowel obstruction, okay? So usually there will be a diagnostic dilemma preoperatively. So that's why most of the patients are diagnosed intraoperatively rather than uh, 
uh, uh, preoperatively. So there is there are there are some surgeons who proposed diagnostic criteria. So clinically, small bowel obstruction, radiographic, large bowel obstruction, and inability to pass sigmoidoscope or rectal failure to do rectal tube deflation. These are sort of diagnostic triad which suggests uh, 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 ilosigmoid nothing. So the patient presented with clinical signs symptoms of small bowel obstruction, if radiology suggests large bowel obstruction, and if failed deflation, so these are indications. So this is these are just suggested diagnostic criteria, not well established diagnostic criteria. Okay. So um, when it comes to the treatment because of high incidence of ischemia and gangrene at the time of presentation, following resuscitation and antibiotic initiation, usually patients are taken for emergency surgery, okay? So uh, preferred surgical uh, approach. So there are some controversies whether to do uh, simple derotation if uh, patients have, have uh, viable uh, segments or, not, uh, or, uh, or to do a resection even if they don't have, if, even if they have a uh, viable one. So the basic, the basic recommendation is most surgeons, they prefer to do, at least they need, they will do, uh, even if both segments are, are, are viable, at least they will do sigmoid resection. Whether it's the emergency setting based on the condition of the patient, which usually doesn't allow, or following, uh, 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 after an appointment, they do elective sigmoid resection to up, to 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 decrease the recurrence of the ilosigmoid nothing, or at least the patients will develop later on sigmoid volvulus. Okay, but when there is gangrenous change in pose, then what is advocated is to do in block resection. So, one thing that what you have to do uh, to 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 keep in mind is it's better better to avoid to trying to untie and tie the knot because untying sometimes is time con consuming, it's difficult and hazardous. It may, it may allow to release some toxic, pro uh, uh, toxic <clears throat> endotox endotoxins and may precipitate shock. Sometimes it may, it may ensure perforation and peritoneal contamination. So rather than trying to untie the knot, it's better to do in-block resection, okay? On the in-block resection, usually what you can do is, you can do iliopolic anastomosis for, or iliolar anastomosis based on the distance from the iliocecal uh, valve, which usually is involved, then the sigmoid colon also can be dealt with individually, okay? We, we don't have to put some kind of Dogmas here, so you can do primary anastomosis safely if you select your patients wisely. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, principles that you need to follow. So shall I continue, Prof? I think we can stop here, and um, you know, because of okay. you know, just to be sensitive our time, and you know, we will maybe take uh, a couple of diverticular disease slides in uh, next week Friday when we get all the speakers back. Mm -hmm. uh, as a panel, maybe you, we can at that time include a couple of really okay. important slides and you can make comments then. So, so there are a few questions which okay. uh, we can get to, but before that, uh, Daniel, are you, uh, Daniel Shuburu, are you on the line? Maybe you, if there is uh, yes, some additional I, yes, comment. Yes, I am. Yes, yes I am if there. you have a, yeah, go ahead. If you have a comment or two, maybe as I put together these questions for... Uh, okay, uh, I think uh, Dr. Antana, that was a very wonderful uh, lecture. Thank you so much. I, have, I was answering some of the questions on the chat, but uh, you are right about, um, I think the, for the take home for the trauma portion of your talk is, uh, you are right, you know, I am penetrating uh, isolated corn trauma Uh -oh. just we just lost you i think oh okay. broken down okay oh yeah Very, uh, primary you know an isolated i mean you have a nice chart there about penetrating uh trauma to the colon uh, uh and, and actually add to that if, if the operating room time is short it's isolated 
uh, even in uh, most devitalized types of colon injuries, you can do resection in primary anastomosis. But if the surgery takes longer, uh, like multiple blood transfusions, other, other injuries, uh, other intra-abdominal injuries, uh, it's safe to do a diversion and come back another day. So just to, uh, for my understanding, you know, uh, when I was a general practitioner in Ethiopia, you know, colonic volvulus was the most common abdominal condition that came through the emergency department. And every intern was supposed to be well-trained in using a, a rectal tube um, and, and maybe also a rigid sigmoidoscopy to really get to the point and, and thread that with lubricant can't, you know, usually, mm -hmm. you know, gel. So, so right now, so what is the day-to-day -day practice? Um, is it the most common or is appendix the most common that you see in, in terms of acute abdomen uh, for patients that come to surgery? Okay, so we are, actually we have the raw data for our uh, hospital for the past three or four years. So the, the commonest acute abdomen that comes to our emergency is acute abdomen, uh, acute appendicitis actually. So, but still, uh, sigmoid volvulus is very common. It's very common. So is, the, is the, the a, teaching is the same. Is a flexible sigmoidoscopy available? Are people doing that in Not centers? No. Okay. So here uh, is a question. No, sorry. Here is a question for you. How do you, how do we get, how do you grade and treat longitudinally lacerated colon wound is the question. Uh, at the same time, there is a question about um, what's the place of segmentary sections and hemicolectomy in penetrating, penetrating injuries in favorable conditions. I think you probably covered mm -hmm. that one during the talk and maybe a, yeah. a, a request from a, a someone who came late. So could you summarize that mm -hmm. again? Oh yeah, okay. So um, in terms of uh, the, doing right hemicolectomy or segmental resection for uh, transverse colon wounds, it's, it, as I've mentioned, it's both safer to do colocolic anastomosis or ilocolic anastomosis. So if you have those, those both, but um, if the wound is proximal to the mid-colic artery, so it's it's even technically easier and much safer to do right hemicolectomy and do iliotransverse anastomosis if the wound is proximal to the mid-colic. If it is distal, then you have both choices, but it's possible and safe to do segmental resection and do colocolic anastomosis safely. Yeah, and it was interesting. In case, yeah. Right. Finish, please. Finish your thought. Yeah, yeah. So the other one is uh, uh, the, uh, the other question was uh, longitudinal uh, laceration. laceration. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if it is if the laceration is longitudinal, then you do transverse repair. So that's the principle for all uh, luminal injuries. Okay, for, for all luminal injuries. So what you have to have to be sure is make sure that which, which, which category your patient falls in. So is this a patient for uh, uh, primary repair or resection and anastomosis or whether this patient is in the category of, of uh, diversion. So if, if the patient in terms of uh, his presentation like um, hemodynamic stability, pre-existing condition, requirement for transfusion and so on fits in the category of primary repairs, and if it is whether it is longitudinal or stop type, whatever, then you can follow the same principle of uh, doing the uh, changing the longitudinal repair and to uh, transfer pain. As a picture, uh, one of the slides there was a picture where you can connect two nearby perforations and do transverse repairs, and you can you can it's, you can you can see that one and do the similar similar uh, you can follow similar principles.
in, in the project. Yeah, so, so thank you. And, and I'm sure you'll share your slides with us so that we can distribute it to everybody uh, to, yeah, sure. to take a look at that. And there is a question, you know, it was very interesting. You brought the war analogy, how war actually um, has been teaching us how to manage colon injuries and, mm -hmm. and you know, the standard practice has been changing a lot. And I also remember at some point, uh, exteriorization of anastomosis was a very common theme. And, and I know that because, <laughs> because I have done that. Um, yeah. So is, that, is there still any place for that? Um, you know, given the algorithm you just showed earlier, uh, is it still worth considering exteriorization in some cases just to, to avoid colostomy and colostomy bag issues? Or what are your thoughts? Mm. Um, so it's as I mentioned in the talk so usually surgeons go back and forth between these dogmatic principles and the actual data out there so the data suggests so there is unless the patients are in those categories there is no need to do uh, diversion or extraorization so repair or resection anastomosis is extremely safe as to the data. Okay. But like, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's clear. I think it's important um, yeah. to, and this is why we do these webinars and discussions, right? I think uh, mm -hmm. sometimes people yeah. get um, worried about the complications, mm -hmm. particularly the leaks. And uh, yeah, I yeah. think as much as, as much as you worry, you can, if it is according to the protocol as your algorithm that you showed, mm -hmm. If they get complicated, you go back in, you take it out and do colostomy and it will be the end of the story. Yeah. But you have to make sure yeah. you follow those patients very closely. How about the distance between the two holes? What do you think is usual measuring stick? How close the two holes have to be to make them one? Or do you sometimes do, yeah. depending on the distance too? Is that more of a personal judgment, uh, surgery judgment or? Any, any it's more of a, a personal judgment, yeah. Yeah, so two things. One thing, is, it's not only actually the distance, it's the viability of the intervening segment as well. And the distance, like, it, 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 it doesn't mention anywhere in textbook or in literatures any, any sort of, like, actual one or two centimeters. It says few centimeters as long as you're comfortable to do the uh, transverse repairs, okay? But... Again, if, if those wounds, the two wounds are rugged wounds, and if the intervening segment is questionable, it's actually better to do resection and anastomosis. So it has to be a clean stab wounds, which are close and uh, comfortable enough to do uh, transverse repairs. So it's, I think it's difficult to put a number on that. I don't know if Daniel can. Yeah, actually, there's another good. Qu I agree with you, and also the anatomy. You know, if the injury is uh, uh, more proximal to the middle colic, it's easier to just resect everything in anastomos. Whereas distal to the middle colic, uh, mobilization and technique can be more difficult. So uh, that's where the, a lot of these judgment calls come in, and whether to repair each injury separately. Uh, versus resection and separately. Um, that, that's what I would add, but I do agree with Antenna. There's a good question that I read, uh, somebody wrote about, maybe Professor Girma, you can ask about, you know, colostomy appliances are difficult uh, in, in Ethiopia. And somebody asked, uh, uh, what is the role of uh, anastomosis in putting the anastomosis extraperitoneally, like in the fascia? Do you do yeah. that? No, we, we talked about it and, you know, Antonis' mm -hmm. recommendation is just follow the general guidelines and recommendation. And uh, just for your, for your information, we used to do that in the 1980s mm -hmm. when I was in Ethiopia, but I don't think it should be the current practice. Um, no, that's what I and, think. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's what Dr. Mm -hmm. Antonis also mentioned a few moments yeah. ago. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I think that EO... Um, um, sigmoid knotting uh, is one of the, you know, things that, you know, when I was in Hawassa a couple of times, everybody has talked about, and I think those case reports have to come out and be reported, and I'm not sure 
where it is in terms of um, uh, the publication, but I think those are important pieces of information to share with the surgical you know, community. So I encourage you guys to, to continue to, to, yeah. to do we have, that. We have, uh, yeah, yeah. So in, 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 in that regard, we have both uh, one case report in pregnant lady with uh, illicit monitoring uh, that's coming out uh, shortly. And we also are analyzing actually the cases. We have around 30 cases, three zero cases that, that uh, are operated over the past three years. So if we add this year, it's come, probably the numbers are bigger. So we're collecting the data and we're going to analyze them. It's gonna come out. So one last question is, um, um, is uh, hematoma in the mesentery um, and how you assess and how do you decide um, uh, and you know, the, you know, from, from resection versus, um, so how do you go by? So you say not in its contusion, it's a, uh, a hematoma, uh, how do you go by treating those patients from trauma perspective? The contusion um, of the colon wall and some hematoma in the middle. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, so in 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 uh, in in the setup in the setup of penetrating injuries, be it uh, mesentric or paracolic uh, uh, hematomas. It's recommended to explore those, okay? But in in uh, in uh, blunt injuries, uh, usually these hematomas are common, and what usually is important is to to check for viability of the colon. If viable, I think it's, it's safer to leave them. Uh, uh, if unless it is uh, expanding and 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 uh, versatile hematomas, that's what uh, I I know. But like I don't know, Daniel, if you can if you can say something. But yeah, if it's it penetrating, is. it's usually better to better to explore those. Yeah, Daniel, any thoughts? You explore yeah, you I mean, find I, a hematoma. I, yeah, I think uh, I'm assuming the question is that when you're in in the abdomen, you see this yes. hematoma. For the most mm -hmm. part, I think you know if you if the outer bowel wall looks viable. Uh, no matter how extensive the hematoma is, you can ignore it. Uh, there's a lot of collateral in the mid gut, in hind gut, that um, uh, even thrombosis of small vessels is not going to cause uh, um, a dead segment uh, and you know future abdominal emergencies. So, so I think when you're in the operating room, if you see a large hematoma and you're worried, you know, you know, you can wrap the bowel with warm towels. And, and give it time, you wait, wait maybe five, 10 minutes. And if you don't see any change in color, uh, we can proceed, you know, of, of, of course, in, in, the, in, in places like America where we have technology, uh, we do have, um, uh, at least it's really, it's really an old technology, but that's now modified where you can inject a patient into sign and green and use uh, a wood lamp. Uh, uh, to see uh, viability of the bowel, you turn you turn off the lights in the operating room and 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 and, and put your wood lamp, and this the segments of bowel that have that are viable would would light up green, uh, so you can do that too uh, if you have that option. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's true, and you can uh, also use uh, continuous wave Doppler, you know, the small Doppler interoperatively and assess as Correct. well, but. Uh, clearly, uh, the best thing to think about probably is, you know, if you are in doubt of the viability, despite all what you have, um, you know, you have also the option of, you know, uh, a second look going back the next day or something, if, you know, if that's possible. Yes. So, yes. Uh, you I, can I think, uh, yes. So, so um, I really appreciate Dr. Antone for this nice presentation, and I hope uh, everybody has gotten um, the survey that was sent to you, uh, please um, make sure you, you, you answer the surveys on inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, you know, as you all know, inflammatory bowel disease is both a surgical and a medical condition. And so when you get the invites, please uh, forward that to your internal medicine colleagues as well. 
so that uh, the it's not going to be only surgical, but it's also a medical issue, and um, and it will be presented by Dr. Daniel Cabrera, who is um, a you know a, a senior um, endoscopist and manages kind of disease. So we are really excited about that presentation because it really brings a little bit surgeons and internists together. Um, so with that, I will just say thank you for attending. Antenna, thank you for this outstanding presentation. And uh, we'll continue uh, on the series on Friday. Have a good day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.